Okay, can I invite the five panel members to come and sit at the table here? We have five people um, and not a lot of time for questions. But um, <laughs> so we've heard about research, data management, we've heard about research for identifiers, we've heard about research performance and measurement of research performance, and we've heard about the open air, um, open access infrastructure for Europe. Um, so do we have questions on any of those topics for any members of the panel? One over there. I have a whole ton of questions, um, but I just want to, I'll just ask two and they're related. Um, that was um, really interesting presentations, all of you, and um, but the, the first two presentations from Edinburgh and Amsterdam, um, you spoke about research data management, but I don't think you actually mentioned open data. And I know Leru um, has advised your institutions um, to go open by default for data. So I was wondering what you were doing, whether you were working with researchers on this. And then related to that, yesterday I was at um, an e um, the EIRG group, which is the Infrastructures Reflection Group. Uh, it's European. And um, the topic came up, uh, how to break down barriers to open data. And, and one person said that um, we were wasting our time talking about embargoes that we should start talking about uh, incentives and changing a set research assessment so that um, researchers would benefit more from making their data open. And we have at least two uniquely qualified people here on the panel who could talk about that. I'd be really interested in hearing your comments. So two questions about encouraging researchers to go open data and then the assessment and evaluation and that would incentivize open data. Uh, right, okay, I'll start with the Amsterdam perspective. Um, open data, we're very much um, in the stage where we want to start capturing the data and we are very aware that there's, even though um, personally I'm all for open data wherever it's possible and I think that's, also, that's actually the official uni university policy, there are many situations where there are very legit, legitimate, legit reasons um, for not being able to. So we're in the capturing stage. I think once we get there, we can solve that. <coughs> so we're not there yet. I think John is a lot further. Yeah, so we're probably in the same place. So what I was emphasizing is about uh, understanding the research process, putting systems in place that can help, that can help administrate, it can help understand policy and compliance. We're really starting with the carrot rather than the stick. And there are some discipline areas where there's you know, considerable open access to data sets and, and depending on subject repositories or all the rest of it. So there's a, a very sort of uneven um, uh, approach taken in different disciplines. In other areas, it's, it's, it's about it's my data. I generated the data. You know, look at, look at the scholarly article and you will find the data. So there is work to be done in terms of that cultural change that we're talking about. We have, a, we have data sharing, we've had that for a couple of years now, which is a, an open access repository for data sets. There's data beginning to go in there, everything from African Dinka songs right through to other, other forms of data that, are, that they don't have a home yet, and that there's a, a necessity to, to share that. But it's very much at the start of the process. We're looking to join everything up and then bring in these compliance issues uh, as they come through and as they, they come up in conversation. Any other comments from anybody in the panel? I'm just adding one thing. Just to uh, add more and boost up what they just said, it, if, if you look at the data pilot from the EC, uh, it gives you an idea of what's going on. Basically, the data pilot has no impositions on open data. So what they say is, if you don't want to publish it, just tell us why. That's the idea. And this is because we are really in an early stage with respect to data. Still, the data in the drawer problem that is, uh, he was mentioning, so pe people is really not publishing data, they keep it in their uh, desktop and uh, in their computers because of the lack of culture in general, but also because of uh, the fear of losing control. That's another uh, big, big problem. So they should be imposed 
you know, to do it. And in other cases, it's because it's part of an economic it's business, basically, so it's justified, the fact. So the EC, what it's trying to do is actually to understand what the scenario is, thanks to the feedback from, from the uh, project beneficiaries. We'll have to explain why they want to keep it. And they will come up with policies, open data policies, that will try to respect all possible uh, point of views. I'd like to add one, one thing, if I may. Um, I, with, with respect to being at, op, at early stages, it's, it's, uh, the norms are paradoxical. If you look at the um, contributor statement, contributor guidelines for science, which are reflective of a whole bunch of journals, it says anything that you use as evidence you should cite. And you, that you can't, you can't make claims without citing evidence. And that, that evidence, whether it's software data, should be available to the community. Full stop, right? Do people, do people follow that? No. But there are interesting leverage points. And uh, last month, PLOS uh, had made a big, there was a big fuss about PLOS changing its data policy to an open data sharing policy. And now everything that you put in PLOS has to be, be shared. But they didn't change their policy. They had that policy. They had the same policies as, as science, more or less. What they changed was, instead of putting, having that policy and having a footnote that says, contact Dr. Bob for the data, they said, by the way, our copy editor needs an accession number. So some of the norms are there, and with some of the, the institutional leverage and infrastructure can shift pretty fast when a journal or a funder decides that instead of just having a footnote that promises to have something happen later, you have a formal identifier, citation, DOI, repository number, et cetera. Thanks. OK. Thank you. Other questions? Um, how do you help the research decide what data to curate? Um, because this is something I keep hearing that it's different for different disciplines and, and nobody really knows. Should it just be the data underlying the publication? Should it be raw, unprocessed data? Like, how are you deciding at institutional level? We don't know. <laughs> no, I mean, it's actually the question. There are issues in data. We, I think we should stop thinking in terms of the old publication, traditional scholarly communication workflows, right? So data, data publishing has similarities with software versioning, for example, has, uh, should be probably part of the research infrastructure itself. So there is, there is no moment in time where you can decide, hey, now I'm going to publish this data because all the intermediate stages may be potentially relevant to reuse your data, so from the raw data to the several secondary data that you're going to produce, all of them have a potential of reuse and are important for your research. So if you think in terms of the research objects, for example, that uh, uh, they're being discussed lately, and I'm not sure you're aware of this, these are all packaging, right? Packages, sorry, of information that are relative to the research life cycle, which might be relevant. So. We, when you talk about data, you have to be discipline specific, community specific, and most of the time when it's, when it's reuse, there is no way out. So it's really hard to take positions that are cross discipline or cross organization. So I'm sure that each of the disciplines will come up with a reasonable uh, uh, policies and some of them are well established and they are actually very productive in, in that sense. Others do not even know they have this issue. They will find out with the open data pilot, probably, and will cost them uh, some effort, but useful effort. But it's, there's no real answer to that, at least. Not one. One size fits all. Yeah, just to emphasize that, and one of the things I was looking at before I came up, 
there is the, the Cambridge crystallography database of all the sort of crystal structures that are, mm -hmm. that are done through research and they're put in. It's, it's nicely done. They've just announced that, that they'll be minting DOIs. That, so that's one area where it seems to be quite organised. And so the institution, when we did our sort of use cases and interviews, they seem to have that fairly settled, as far as we understood it. And, and in other areas, there's, there's just very little awareness about it. And so there, there needs to be a, a change within the discipline and with the funders and with the institutions supporting that. But again, it's, it's back to, I think what you're looking for is answers that we can maybe provide in a couple of years' time, not at the moment, for everything. But, but for some of the disciplines, they're really well ahead of, it, of that. Thank you. Any other questions? Chris Banks. <laughs> Chris Banks, Imperial College, London. Um, one of the challenges I'm seeing with the big open agenda at the moment is the fact that on one hand we are, uh, our funders are seeking to um, encourage our academics to publish open access and we've, we've talked about the carrots and the sticks. And yet the other carrots that we haven't talked about today are the fact that um, the, author, uh, the academic reward mechanisms are often based on uh, publication in high impact journals and those journals are frequently not open access or reluctantly and very high cost open access. Um, and also our authors uh, and our academics like the elitism of the institutions that they work in, they like the league tables, they like being in institutions that climb up league tables. So we've still got that kind of um, the reward mechanisms based on that in uh, a, a kind of funder-driven dr um, push towards open access. And I just wonder whether in any of the, I mean, UK is one of these, but I wonder whether in any of the other um, areas that are, is, is kind of moving towards open access, whether there's a move towards accepting the something like, or moving even to discussing the San, Fran San Francisco Declaration, which is on, on how one um, begins to evaluate a researcher's output without looking at the journal and not simply looking at the journal and the metrics that that journal comes with. Somebody want to take that? If I can. <laughs> so uh, this has been thoroughly discussed, of course. It's an interesting mm, question. So the EC is actually acting at different levels. This is an example from the EC, but consider that what you are, uh, that your question uh, poses uh, huge <laughs> uh, question marks on uh, the whole business models of publishers, right? So when the when the commission started doing these things, they would know already that they would have to fight or somehow come to an agreement with the publishers. So the overall philosophy that I see there under the hoods is that the commission is moving money from the libraries who are currently paying their uh, subscriptions to, to the journals to the researchers that will pay for gold open access. That, is, that will go on for a while. And actually, in the new uh, open data, open access pilot of the commission, uh, four millions are dedicated just to this, right? So to give money to researchers who are still publishing on non open access journals, but they would like to be open access. So the commission is actually thinking about that, right? As a, as, an, as, a, as a transaction, you have to go through it to migrate. As to the impact, the citation that you mentioned, it's true that many of the journals, the most important branding, the most important titles are today non-open access, but it's also true that uh, a brand builds over time, right? So the new journals, the new open access journals are becoming more and more important. And in fact, there are several studies that are proving that if you publish open access, your research reaches uh, a larger uh, chunk uh, of uh, your community. And this, is, this has been proved in several ways. There are indicators about this and that. And then, as it was discussed today, without metrics and so on, I think we should move away from the whole uh, citation impact based on journals and based on, so I think other products are as important as uh, publications. There are other uh, paradigms proposed out there, for example, the self-publishing paradigm, 
the one adopted by archive, where you put a piece of information like a, a, a journal, uh, paper somewhere on the web, and it's the crowd of researchers that judges how good it is. This is just one of the several examples. And then, uh, I know that this is bad to say, but look at Google. Have you, have you seen these uh, Google Impact tools out there on the web? These are fantastic because what they're looking for is basically links, right? Links between the papers and other papers, but not only. So they put in the same uh, pool, in the same bag, journals of any kind, open access, not open access, Scopus, enrolled, and conferences. So what they're really looking at is how many links to your publications uh, are available out there, possibly going beyond the bibliography style of citation. And this gives you a different figure. Actually, actually, this conflicts with the Thomson Reuters approach, right? Which is restricted to certain kind of publication and gives new numbers, new inputs. In fact, they have their own impact factors which are uh, quite interesting and I suggest you to look at. Unfortunately, it's Google. It's not <laughs> the public domain. But on the, on the other hand, fortunately, there is Google because, you know, Thomson Reuters at the moment, sorry if somebody is here, <laughs> is actually ruling the world in that sense. Thank you. Paul, do you want to comment? Yes, yes. I think it's a very fundamental question. Um, and uh, we are indeed also exploring uh, the potential of Google Scholar, especially for those fields in social sciences and humanities that are not well represented in the web of science. But I think before uh, doing jumping too quickly to alternative metrics, um, the goal is probably, the, the, the question is not in the first place which new targets should be set in a research evaluation for the researchers. The main question is what are the core criteria that we want uh, researchers to uh, incorporate in their uh, uh, own academic work. What kind of evaluation criteria should we put central? And this is a very fundamental question because it, it addresses the question what type of science and scholarship do we actually need if the world in all sorts of ways is, all, is all moving towards open frameworks in all varieties in which we still will have unequal power relationships and we need to have elites that are functioning and that are also driving innovation and, and high quality research. So this is the problem. There is a certain tendency in the world of open access to think in terms of equality, openness, democracy, and at the same time we know that this, the creation of knowledge is a stratified affair in which you shouldn't wish away, you shouldn't want to wish away uh, cognitive intellectual uh, elites and also centers of excellence uh, uh, concentrated in certain universities. So this is actually a, a bit of a paradox uh, that we can't think away. Uh, and I don't think there is an easy solution, but, but one question would be, of course, that um, funding agencies by their power of being able to fund future research or current new research projects uh, uh, will directly influence the criteria that researchers are using because the amount of funding that you collect contributes to your reputation. So that's one feedback mechanism that will support this drive towards open access. You can expect that a number of high quality journals will move into some sort of open access regime to try to accommodate this. So there are some correction mechanisms. But um, it is true that um, there is also a certain contradiction at the very heart of, uh, of the uh, evaluation process. Um, and um, there are several scenarios in which this will somehow create a new balance. Uh, I don't know which scenario will develop. And at the moment, my feeling is if I talk with colleagues in the UK and colleagues in the Netherlands, that actually the scenarios are a bit different, uh, partly because of the different epistemic cultures. Um, 
I'm not sure whether researchers are very fond of the university league tables, but they certainly are very aware of the competition in their own field uh, and also where they stand in the rank order of, uh, uh, yeah, of, of uh, 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 yeah, in, in their field or, or f for their funding. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that, um, uh, well, what, what we at CBTS try to do is to, to rethink the, the, the core criteria that should be taken into evaluation and then start to think about the indicators that should be used instead of the other way around. Uh, but this is only the beginning of uh, a kind of trying to find the solution. I don't have the solution at this moment. Okay, thank you. Could I ask you please all to join me in thanking the panelists from this afternoon's session?